Hello, good evening. Welcome. I'll take just a moment here uh, as our participants begin to enter the uh, Zoom room here. I want to welcome all of you to the third and final lecture in our Cummer Beaches lecture series this, this year, 2021-2022. Uh, this is our third lecture in the series. And on behalf of the Cummer Beaches, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, the museum, uh, uh, Dr. Jacobson, Diane Jacobson, who has sponsored this series generously. I want to thank uh, the Cummer Museum for uh, its staff and support in putting on these lectures. And I want, of course, thank my uh, uh, colleagues and uh, friends on the Cumber Beaches board uh, for the work that goes into uh, the mission of the Cumber Beaches, uh, the Cumber Museum, and, and of course, the lectures, which I enjoy, uh, have enjoyed giving so very, very much this year. This has been a particularly special uh, year for our lecture series because, of course, it is the anniversary of the, the Comers founding and always uh, an opportune time then to reflect on the mission of our museum of art in public spaces and uh, uh, history and the, the commemorative uh, function of museums. So as we begin here today, let me thank you all for joining us to talk about some of the special treasures from Nina Kummer's collection. When Nina Kummer endowed the museum uh, through her bequest in 1959-1960, she left some 50 odd uh, works of art from her personal collection which form the cornerstone of the Kummer Museum's collection and which defined its collecting impulse and its direction in those early years of its history. Uh, the collection that Nina assembled, she put together in, in large measure rather late in her life. Uh, her passions and her interests that we've explored in our previous two lectures uh, took her in the earlier decades of her life in many different directions in public service and in uh, civic life from gardens and parks and uh, child uh, health and welfare uh, to, uh, of course, her own private gardens. It wasn't until relatively late in her life that she began seriously collecting with the intention of endowing an, a museum uh, and leaving it essentially to the public uh, in trust uh, for use by the city of Jacksonville and the North Florida region, just as it is today. And when she began uh, seriously collecting, uh, Nina, of course, was confronted by the, the very same question or problem that confronts many collectors, every collector really, what to collect, uh, how to collect, and why to collect. Uh, the collection, any collection really, is a portrait of its, uh, its collector. And so today I want to explore the collection uh, that Nina put together that she left as the foundation uh, of the uh, Cummer Museum today. And I want to take a sort of liberty here intellectually and as a scholar with these works. I'm going to consider them not only as historical objects, but also as objects that offer us a kind of allegorical insight into Nina herself. Uh, of course, uh, as I said, every collection is, in some ways, a portrait of its collector. It offers us insight into their psychology, their motives, their motivations, their impulses, their ideas and interests. And that's, of course, very clearly true of many of the objects in Nina's collection. We could say that, that some of the works in the Cumber Museum and some of the works that Nina collected could only have been collected by Nina and could only belong to the Cumber Museum. Uh, one of these works, just obviously to cite an example, is the portrait of Nina Cummer by Alice Kent Stoddard that we talked about uh, in our very first lecture, in fact, going back to uh, last fall. Uh, and now, obviously, a portrait of the collector uh, is an obvious item to find in, in a collection of works of art. But 
at the same time, I, I think that there's something very revealing about this particular work. If you attended our first lecture back in the fall, um, then you remember perhaps that we talked about this particular painting as an example of Nina's interest in the patronage of women artists, her interest in women as professionals in the art. Alice Kent Stoddard, Stoddard the, the painter of this particular portrait, is one of the leading portrait painters of the uh, late 19th, early 20th century, and one of the most successful women artists of her era. She's a Philadelphia artist, uh, not a local by any stretch of the imagination. And so it's very clear that Nina Kummer, uh, when she decided, uh, along with her husband, Arthur, to, uh, to commission this work, she uh, thought very methodically and carefully about who was to paint it and sought out uh, a female painter, gave her patronage to uh, one of the leading painters of the period, but also uh, a, a woman who was thus uh, unusual in the broader field of painting still in the early 20th century as a professional of great attainment and broad public recognition. That, that act of commissioning a work uh, by the female painter, Alice Kent Stoddard, is a revealing testimony, the kind of collecting impulse that we might find in other objects in Nina's collection. Now, if you have been to the Kummer Museum lately, I understand that they have done a little bit of a redesign in the Tudor room, and uh, they have reinstalled the Tudor portrait, uh, appropriately enough, that Nina uh, acquired as a part of her collection. This is an object that is a particular favorite of mine, and I'm so glad to get to talk about it today because it's been off view for uh, a very long time, quite uh, a long time, in fact, uh, far too long. And I am uh, so pleased to see it come back out of the museum's vaults and into public display. Uh, it is, as an object, as a collection object, an unusual and a vexing object. And I love vexing works of art. It's a little bit mysterious, maybe more than a little bit. And, and it's also, as a, a work of art, one of the uh, more modest objects that Nina, accomered in the, uh, Nina, Nina acquired in the course of her career. It is not, by any stretch of the imagination, a masterpiece. Uh, it is an, an anonymous work of a lady whose name we don't know. Uh, and uh, on that account, it is uh, uh, certainly not uh, a work that uh, uh, we can compare to some of the real masterpieces that Nina did acquire, uh, the, uh, the great early Renaissance masterpiece by Agnolo Gatti or the Peter Paul Rubens that we'll talk about later in our talk. But this work is for me a quintessential object in Nina's collection, the kind of object that maybe Nina uh, really particularly in her temperament and her, her concept of herself and the mission of her collection thought about very deeply when she acquired it. It's not the kind of work that for instance, a, uh, an advisor or a scholar would have advised her to acquire as the foundation of a collection, uh, far from it. It is uh, not, uh, a, a, from an aesthetic standpoint, uh, an artistic standpoint, a cornerstone object in a new collection. But it is a really fascinating historical object that uh, was painted in around 1592. Uh, we know from the date, which is still inscribed uh, at the very top of the picture, there's an, a letter A standing for the, the word anno, year in Latin, 1592. And so uh, we have a sense of when and where this was painted. And the character of the woman depicted in it is really quite striking as well. In some respects, this painting is a characteristic Tudor portrait. Uh, and we can see in the Tudor room today, it hangs not far from Nina's uh, uh, self-portrait. I actually think that there's kind of a resemblance between them. And I wonder if it occurred to Nina that this uh, rather uh, gritty, steely-eyed woman from the 16th century had uh, a nose and a mane and a, a face that was similar to her own. But as a Tudor portrait, our picture is quite comparable to other well-known Tudor paintings from the 16th century. Here is Anne Boleyn, for instance, from circa 1536. Uh, you can see that the posture of the figure, the angle of the face, 
uh, and even certain generic qualities of the nose and the lips and the eyes. Uh, these are, are characteristic stylistic attributes of Tudor portraiture that uh, don't tell us much about what the person Anne Boleyn actually looked like, but that are typical of the way that women were represented in 16th century portraiture at this moment in Tudor England. You can see that like our picture, there's writing on the canvas here, the name Anna Bolina Uxor, the wife of Henry VIII, Henry Octa. And that's very characteristic also of our picture, which has really interesting writing on it that we'll come back to in just a moment. You can see here Lady Philippa Coningsby by George Gower from 1578, which has both her name inscribed around her head and down below a little motto in French, a little moral motto that reads, les plaisirs sont mortels, mais les honneurs sont endurables, which means in English, pleasures are mortal, they pass away, but honor, nobility is eternal. It's a little moral message, which is not uncommon for these Tudor portraits. And indeed our picture also has a moral message. Here is uh, the Duchess of Chandos by John Bettis the Younger, uh, another characteristic image. You can see how similar the posture and the posing of these figures uh, from picture to picture really are. And uh, here very, the very famous Mary Queen of Scots the Catholic would-be monarch uh, uh, who was the, uh, the great rival of uh, Elizabeth I and who spent much of her life in captivity imprisoned in part because of her Catholic faith and, and her uh, adversarial position in relationship to uh, her cousin Elizabeth. Uh, Mary Queen of Scots here represented again with writings and inscriptions on the canvas and bedecked with various ornaments of the Catholic faith, which identified her very directly in opposition to Elizabeth and the Protestant Anglican tradition. Here, another image of Mary Stuart, Mary Queen of Scots. And here, uh, uh, an image of Elizabeth I herself as a young girl, a princess, not yet a queen, um, and you can see a very fine, very rich portrait. Look at that lovely dress, the brocade and the, the damask and silk, so such a beautiful painting. Uh, another image of Elizabeth. Uh, and Elizabeth, I think, and the Tudor portrait, the Tudor portrait of women in particular, is something that would have appealed to Nina if we can think about, again, Nina's personality as a collector. Nina and her patronage of women, her interest in women who hold authority, who take responsibility, who get things done in their worlds. And uh, Elizabeth and the Tudor woman in general were such women. The 16th century in England was a, a new moment in the, the history of matriarchy, uh, a rare moment uh, in the history of England of real female power not only Mary, Queen of Scots, but Elizabeth I. And across the uh, channel in France, also we see uh, Catherine de' Medici in the same era as extraordinarily powerful female monarchs holding power in their own names without uh, uh, needing men by their sides to justify their uh, regency and their power. And this image is a, a wonderful little painting of Elizabeth I, which I think makes this point very clearly. It is a retelling of a classical story about a man with Elizabeth cast in the role of the man, Paris from Greek mythology. And it's Paris who started the Trojan War by abducting Helen of Troy. And uh, the story of their uh, coming together, Paris and Helen, is a story involving the three goddesses, uh, uh, Minerva and Juno and uh, Aphrodite or Venus. And uh, the three goddesses were having a beauty contest. They asked Paris, the man, to come and judge the contest. They, uh, uh, the reward was uh, a golden apple. And Paris was asked to bestow the golden apple on whichever of the women was the most beautiful. And each one of them offered uh, uh, Paris a different reward if he would choose her. Uh, in this retelling of the story, there is no Paris, there is no man. Instead, we have Elizabeth I, and she decides to keep the golden apple for herself quite wisely, because of course, 
Paris uh, choosing a, a winner was the cause of the Trojan War and of one of the great um, uh, wartime uh, narratives and tragedies in the history of human civilization. So our Tudor portrait from 1592, painted uh, in the latter part of Elizabeth's reign, is a, a portrait that I think as a work of art would have appealed to Nina and her sense of women's history and her sense of women's presence in uh, 20th century society. Uh, acquired not long, of course, after women's suffrage in America, uh, a cause for which Nina was uh, worked hard and was devoted to during her work in the 18, late 1890s and uh, the early 1900s for the Women's Club of Jacksonville, as we talked about in our last uh, Cumber Beaches lecture. The image of this strong, gritty looking, steely eyed woman, uh, a, a woman of great power, we can tell from this image. She's, of course, a noble woman. That is uh, the sort of woman who would have had her portrait painted in this manner in the late. 16th century. She is uh, also a woman of great moral fiber and character, as we learn when we look more deeply at the picture. There is an inscription, as on many Tudor portraits, next to the, uh, the woman in our picture, just to the left of her head. It's an inscription in Latin, and it's one of the things that makes this picture, I think, one of the most precious historical objects in the Cummers collection. As a work of art, we might say the artist is anonymous and the painting has seen better days, but as a historical object, this is an absolute priceless treasure, which I think only someone with Nina's particular vision would have recognized the value of. The inscription here reveals a great, wonderful mystery that has, I think, never been explained before today. It is a Latin text, which dates back to the 11th century. Nec Deus est nec homo prisons quem cernes imago, sed Deus et homo prisons quem signat imago. That is the Latin text, which means in translation, neither God nor man is the present image which you perceive, but God and man is he whom the present image signifies. This text no doubt seems mysterious to many of us, and it requires a, a little bit of explanation to understand it. It is a text, a poem really, that goes back to the 11th century, it was written by the 11th century poet Baldric of Dole, uh, an important figure in the history, history of medieval poetry, but hardly a name that we're familiar with today. And it's a text that achieved a huge popularity in the Middle Ages. We find it inscribed quite frequently on uh, works of religious art that were intended for devotion, in particular images of Christ, of the crucifixion, uh, of the descent from the cross, of the, the eke homo, the presentation of Christ with his wounds, of devotional objects that participate, in other words, in a Catholic religious tradition of the Middle Ages and the early modern period. But it's precisely these sorts of religious images that were uh, beginning with the Protestant Reformation, banned from religious life in England and on uh, uh, continental Europe in uh, new Protestant spaces. Now, Elizabeth was a Protestant. And in fact, she was uh, 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 at war with the Catholic uh, community of Europe and with Catholics in England for much of her reign. Catholics were widely oppressed and persecuted during uh, Elizabeth's reign, as a matter of fact. And this text is necessarily a Catholic text. It is a Catholic devotional text. That um, is absolutely uh, a sign that the identity of this woman is that of a recusant, a Catholic, uh, uh, dissenter, religious dissenter in Elizabeth in England, a person who would have um, been actively persecuted uh, in all likelihood during the reign of Elizabeth for her religious faith. The recusants were a, um, a fairly large community in England, but to have yourself painted in this way in a public manner with a text that would identify you along with what was invariably right above the text 
the coat of arms, which has, has rather disappeared, I think, in the current painting, the preservation of the painting is not perfect. We've lost that coat of arms, so it's very difficult to identify her house. But this text would have identified her quite publicly as a faithful Catholic. And if it were not for the, the text, we still have in our hands a little Psalter, a devotional Psalter uh, of the kind that was very common in Catholic religious life in the early modern period, stamped with the initial, no doubt, of her last name. I think it would be wonderful as a research project to discover who this woman was. I, I believe we could probably figure it out. There were not that many prominent uh, uh, recusant families in England that we couldn't track down one with the last name of B that would have a... Uh, uh, a formidable woman like this uh, who might be pictured in, in the image. But the, the text in front of us, the little Psalter, uh, our portrait sitter has her finger tucked into the book that in a way that leaves the pages open just enough to reveal the letters of, of the word Psalm X, Psalm 10, corresponding in the the Catholic uh, Bible of the Middle Ages and the early modern period to uh, Psalm 11 in the, the modern Protestant uh, 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 Bible. But I offer you here a few verses from Psalm 10, which obviously was important to this woman. And the Lord, I put my trust. How then do you say to my soul, get thee away from hence to the mountain like a sparrow? For lo, the wicked have bent their bow and they have prepared their arrows in the quiver to shoot in the dark the upright of heart, but they have destroyed the things which thou hast made. But what has the just man done? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes look on the poor man. His eyelids examine the sons of men. And this is a song, which is a song of oppression and a song of faith. It is about a righteous person or a person of faith who is oppressed precisely for what they believe in, whose whose works are racked and ruined and destroyed by those who would disenfranchise them. Uh, it is a song also of uh, uh, the Lord's looking down on people's works, the human works, and judging those works by their quality and judging the conditions of people, looking down and seeing the poor and the rich alike and knowing them for their works. It's a fascinating illusion to find in this portrait because it is an illusion that reveals even more deeply the recusant uh, uh, character of this woman in this picture. Now, if we can think for a moment about how Nina, if she knew this, uh, might have thought about this woman, I think here we have a kindred spirit, uh, not only to Nina Kummer, but to the uh, many of the women uh, of the, uh, uh, the early 20th century, of the 19th century, uh, the women who we've talked about in our previous lectures in the Cumberbatch series, the artists and the intellectuals and the writers and the political activists who um, were like this recusant woman in many ways dissenters out of step with the orthodoxy and with the status quo of their own society, but steadfast in their belief in certain values and truths and staunch defenders of those truths and of those moral imperatives for equality and for shared participation in American civic life and government. And in many ways, we might look at this 16th century woman as a historical counterpart to Nina Kummer. And even if Nina didn't know all of these things about the recusant character of this Catholic woman from the 16th century, I think she could have gleaned from the intensity of her gaze and from the steeliness of her expression that here was a person of real grit and fiber, someone to admire. There are other works like these uh, two portraits which uh, have an obvious place in Nina's collection. It makes a great deal of sense, of course, for us to find in her collection a lots of beautiful pictures of landscapes and flowers and beautiful places and spaces. Nina's love of gardens and her deep investment in natural beauty, not only in her own gardens, but in the city of Jacksonville through her work on parks and on uh, public recreational spaces, as we talked about in our previous lectures, is reflected in many of Nina's collecting choices, which again, we can say some of these objects could only have really been collected by Nina Kummer or, or a person very much like her. 
This painting, for instance, by Martin Johnson Heed, for instance, is a, a wonderful piece for us, a real masterpiece of American art in the Kummer collection, which was acquired by by uh, Nina. Now, Martin Johnson Heed, who was a very successful artist in his own career, um, he's since his death come to be considered as one of the really great American painters of the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, and in fact, uh, his, uh, his work is very relevant to us here in Jacksonville because he, although he was not born in Florida, spent much of his life living in Jacksonville, St. Augustine and did much of his painting in St. Augustine. So I think we can say again, like the portraits we've just discussed, here is a work that really belongs in Nina's collection. It makes sense to find it there. It fits with her interests. And of course it fits in our community, in our space as a piece of our local history. And this is not a painting of a Florida flower, uh, but rather a picture of South American flora and fauna painted by Martin Johnson Heed, who also made many beautiful paintings of the St. John's region and the North Florida landscape. Uh, for a more local view, we might look at Winslow Homer's Waiting for a Bite. Uh, Winslow Homer, another really standout American artist. These are both masterpieces of American painting that are in our collection. Uh, and uh, he also, of course, spent time down here in Jacksonville. And this is a painting which he made of the St. John's River and a fisher boy uh, out on the river on a, on a great log waiting for a bite. It is um, another spectacular piece of American painting, but also one that has a local resonance and significance here in our landscape. A really terrific, I think, uh, example, both of Nina's collecting strategy she obviously is interested in things that appeal to her, that reflect her interests, but also things that, that feed back into our community, uh, that are part of our community's own history and our sense of self here in the North Florida region. So when we find um, something that's a little further afield, I, I, I like Corot's landscape here, Jean-Baptiste Camille Corot, who is a French landscape painter of the 19th century and one of the, the great French landscape painters of the era. He's not painting the St. John's, but based on our knowledge of Nina and uh, the pictures that we've seen, a picture like this fits right into our understanding of Nina as a collector interested in natural beauty and in the landscape and in uh, the flora and fauna of the world. In fact, these, the, uh, uh, this tree alley and uh, little canal looks so much in some ways like the reflecting ponds in Nina's garden that we have to think perhaps that there was a little association there that, that triggered her fondness for this particular picture by Corot. The argument I'm making is that Nina, when she began to collect seriously, didn't set out simply to collect a bunch of anonymous masterpieces, and that is, you know, works without any particular relevance to her or to Jacksonville, beyond the fact that they were masterpieces of historical art. I think, on the contrary, she was interested first in the criterion of relevance, whether these were meaningful works of art to her, whether they were meaningful as uh, moral and social and aesthetic reflections on the world that she wanted to live in and on the world that she wanted to leave to us through her museum. I think as a secondary criterion, it appears maybe Nina was interested in acquiring famous names and, and uh, major works of art. Uh, certainly there are some masterpieces in her collection and she was an ambitious collector. You have to be in order to acquire masterpieces by Rubens and, and Gatti and and uh, Lucas Cranach and other uh, blue chip A-list artists of the past. But I think Nina was first motivated by the sense of moral and aesthetic significance of the works that she was acquiring. A work here by Thomas Gainsborough, the great um, uh, English pastoralist and landscape artist is one that fits into our discussion of Nina's interest in, in landscape. This one also currently hangs in the Tudor room. And her image of the, the four seasons is one also that connects us to the natural world. Here we see spring, summer, fall, and autumn painted in the 16th century grisaille series of panels, uh, which pose another mystery. Undoubtedly, these were the exterior panels of a polyptych of a four panel, at least a four panel painting. It'd be wonderful to know where they came from. 
and what their history is and how they came down to us. A little research project for me for the future. In the atrium of the museum today, we find Giovanni della Robbia's Tabernacle, uh, which is one of my favorite works. These wonderful festoons and garlands of flowers and fruits that surround this uh, painted ceramic tabernacle with a, a wonderful door, an opening and closing door, which would have contained in a, a Renaissance church, the Eucharistic host and wine uh, used for the sacrament. From gardens, however, we move to another of Nina's interests, which I think is richly reflected in the works of art that she acquired. Much of Nina's work in the city of Jacksonville through the Women's Club uh, was focused, and, and through her work uh, for the Garden Society as well, was focused on the well being of children, on issues of public health, on school and education, uh, on parks and playgrounds and, and healthy environments as we've talked about uh, in our previous lectures. The late 19th, the early 20th century was a transformational period, not just in Jacksonville, but especially in Jacksonville, in terms of our understandings of diseases like the yellow fever and our ability to, uh, to promote public health and, and to reform public education, to make, in other words, the world that we want to live in rather than the world that we had at the time. Nina was a crucial part of that, an activist in many ways. Uh, she was obviously deeply interested in the well-being of children. And I think this particular masterpiece, this is another of the really important works in our collection, which is only is one only Nina really could have acquired. Uh, it, it really is a kind of signature piece in the collection that we can thank her for. The Diving Boy by Augusta Savage is a work that, uh, that really stands out in this interest of Nina's in, in children. Augusta Savage, of course, is the now um, uh, um, celebrated um, African-American female artist, sculptor, monumental sculptor of the early 20th century. It was enormously successful in her own career, uh, um, but at the same time struggled uh, as, as obviously uh, was um, inevitable in the climate of uh, uh, racial and uh, gender oppression that still existed in the early 20th century in, in very formal ways, of course, um, uh, in the era of Jim Crow, in the era of uh, uh, the early era of the female suffrage, woman suffrage in America. And Augusta Savage's Diving Boy is a, a special work in many respects in regard to this history. Uh, history in Jacksonville and the history across the country of women and of African Americans. Uh, Nina Savage made this piece, uh, or excuse me, Augusta Savage made this piece in around 1939. And in that year, she visited Nina Kummer in Jacksonville, and uh, Nina acquired the piece. The circumstances in which she acquired it are remain a little bit mysterious. And there again is another research project uh, for us to explore how this piece came into Nina's possession. Uh, but it's entirely possible that Augusta was seeking funding to cast another major piece. Augusta Savage was one of the, the first really prominently successful uh, women sculptors and African-American women sculptors of the 20th century. And in 1939, she had a huge important piece accepted for display at the New York World's Fair, where it was displayed until 1940, when at the end of the fair, the piece was destroyed. It exists today in a number of, of, of replicas. The piece was meant to be cast in bronze, but the plaster replica, the plaster uh, model that Augusta produced was the one that was displayed at the World's Fair. Casting in bronze is hugely expensive. Bronze is a very costly medium, uh, not only in terms of the raw materials, but also in the industrial processes required to produce bronze sculpture. And Augusta was never able in her lifetime to cast this sculpture in bronze. Uh, we're going to get one, however, uh, for the James Weldon Johnson Park in downtown Jacksonville in the very near future. Um, uh, and uh, it is, of course, a very appropriate sculpture for that space because the title of it, Lift Every Voice and Sing, commemorates the, the song written by James Welton Johnson. It is uh, a, a masterpiece of uh, 20th century sculpture, a very important work, but it's one whose sad history of destruction reminds us of the importance of the medium of bronze, uh, a costly and expensive medium, but one that is incredibly durable. 
once you cast something in bronze, essentially it will last forever. Uh, that is, unless we take it and we uh, go ahead and melt it down. Uh, this is one of the few bronze sculptures that Augusta Savage succeeded in casting in her life. Uh, she made lots of works. Many of them, of course, don't survive because she was unable to bring them into cast conditions. So this is a precious work on many counts. And it's one that is especially poignant, I think, to me because of its subject. The medium of bronze, which is durable, which is strong, which is tough, which is also rich and valuable. Bronze, of course, defines a whole era of human history in the Bronze Age, and it was for centuries, millennia, really, used as currency. Casting something in bronze was literally giving it value by making it out of money, as it were. And, and in this case, that durability, that richness, and that value are, are given, they're attributed to a subject which has a very short history in, the, in, in human uh, representation and human art. It's only for a few hundred years that people have been making pictures of kids. I had someone, a colleague early in my career, ask me about this, and it, I had to think about it. But it is not until the 17th century that we begin to find representations of children who really just don't figure in, in much of Western art uh, tradition. And why? Uh, well, when we think about the purposes of art to commemorate uh, uh, rich and powerful people, especially men, uh, children rarely make the cut. Uh, and uh, to give value to a subject like this, as Nina sought to do through her activist uh, work, through her, her civic work in the city of Jacksonville, to give value to the lives of children, to give value to children through casting the subject of this vulnerable young child in bronze, that's a very poignant and a very resonant kind of image for me. The Comer has another work uh, from Augusta Savage, and Augusta took children as a frequent subject of her representation. Uh, another work, uh, the, the, perhaps Augusta Savage's most famous surviving work, Gammon, uh, from 1929. Gammon, a French word which simply means young scamp, you know, a, 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 you know, a little boy, a, um, a rascal. And uh, this is uh, her work, Gammon, which exists in a number of plaster copies and one bronze cast original, which is in the New York Public Library. And in recent years, the Comer, of course, has acquired a copy of this work, which is uh, a really special, special work. Again, because of its poignancy in part, the title, Rascal, Scamp, Gammon, that is a title that reminds us of the status of this child, a status which is, uh, that is, um, by any traditional measure, not especially powerful, not famous, not wealthy, not, uh, not racially or, uh, or in terms of his age, uh, a person who is considered by his society in ordinary circumstances to be worthy of the commemoration of a bronze statue. When we think of the bronze statues and where we find them in our world and in, in the halls of power and in, and in venerable institutions of higher education, and we think of the subjects that are depicted in those bronze statues, almost all men of a, a certain uh, accomplishment and, and, and um, mainstream power and authority in society. Uh, Augusta Savage's notion goes directly against this idea of uh, by commemorating a, an anonymous and nameless young boy, although in fact the, the sculpture was modeled after her nephew, so it's not a nobody, uh, we know exactly who the model was, but she did not title the work after her nephew, instead preferring this anonymously suggestive name, Gamin. Augusta's uh, image of the diving boy, Nina acquired in 1939. It's the kind of work, again, only Nina could have possessed. She knew Augusta Savage and had a relationship with her in part because Augusta Savage is from the Jacksonville region, born in Green Cove Springs and returned here frequently throughout her life. Although she is famously associated with the Harlem Renaissance and that's where she did much of her work and where she maintained her school. So this is a work which Nina brought home to the city of Jacksonville. If we can clarify the, the way in which she acquired it, I think it would be a very important story to tell for the history of the Comer and of the city of Jacksonville. But it is only one of the many works that Nina acquired which are about children and uh, motherhood. Cradle Hymn by James Northcote, which we see the little uh, 
scamp here sleeping in the bassinet down in the bottom left-hand corner of the picture were uh, Lady Harriet Dawn and her son. Or even from the Renaissance here, Giacomo Francia's The Virgin Child and St. John. Uh, or, or perhaps uh, most interestingly, uh, Lucas Cranach the Elder's St. Christopher uh, uh, carrying the Christ child across the river. This is a really neat one. Uh, the story of St. Christopher is of a saint who um, is a big, powerful, tough guy. In fact, he's the most strong, powerful, tough guy practically that exists anywhere in the world. And his goal is to work for the most powerful man in the world. He's a tough guy and he wants to be the right-hand man to a powerful king. So he meets a, a hermit and the hermit says, well, the most powerful person in the world is Jesus Christ. And Christopher says, well, where is this Jesus Christ? And, and hermit says, well, don't get ahead of yourself. Why don't you do something useful for the world uh, rather than running around looking for kings? Why don't you stand here at this river? A lot of people drown crossing this river and you're a big, strong guy. You could help carry them across the river so they don't drown. And Christopher says, okay, I'll do that. And he's doing it. And he helps a lot of people across. And then one day this small child comes and says, will you help me across? And, and so Christopher picks him up on his shoulders and starts to carry him across. And as they go, uh, the baby gets heavier and heavier. Christopher is barely struggling across the river. He gets to the other side and he says, why, why are you so heavy? You're just a little kid. And uh, of course it is the Christ child and he says, it's because I carry the whole world in my hands. So you, you were carrying the whole world on your shoulders there. But it's an image there, I think, that uh, probably would have spoken very, very strongly to Nina, that the moral there of uh, the heavy work of caring for people and, and for children in particular, for people per particularly that cannot give anything back to you, uh, uh, helping them simply because you're there at the river and they need help across. From children, of course, the natural segue is to women and to mothers. And there are a lot of interesting representations of women in uh, uh, Nina's collection, including another of her great masterpieces. And this is really, in terms of the historical uh, artistic significance, one of the most important works that Nina acquired. Agnolo Gatti, uh, an early uh, Renaissance 14th century painter, an heir of Giotto, the great Renaissance master. Agnolo Gatti's Madonna of Humility is a fabulous work that would belong in any collection anywhere in the world. It's a, a really spectacular piece. The kind of work that if you were gonna found a museum, people might advise you to buy. But again, I think that Nina's interest in it probably was as much personal as it was, uh, you know, uh, that of an ambitious collector. This particular story that's represented here, the Madonna of Humility, is a story about a particular kind of woman. Um, it is the image of the Virgin Mary, seated on the ground, uh, a form of the iconography of the Mary in, in medieval and Renaissance art that we call because she's on the ground there, the Madonna of humility. In Latin, the word humus, from which we get the word humility, is literally means ground or earth. Uh, and that motif of humility, of a, of a woman who is, after all, here chosen by God to be the mother of, of his son, uh, uh, a woman who nevertheless maintains uh, her concept of humility and of self in the face of that, uh, that honor, that dignity. We see another version by Agnolo Gatti of the Madonna of Humility in the Rijksmuseum, and another version of the subject, which was enormously common in the, in the late Renaissance, or in the, uh, the late Middle Ages, the early Renaissance, by Caterina Veneziano. This one is in the Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, uh, that focus on women takes us to another signature masterpiece of the Commerce Collection, which is the Peter Paul Rubens Lamentation of Christ. Now that you might think that this is, you would be excused for thinking this is a painting about Christ, about the subject of, of the man, Christ, but it is not. In fact, the Lamentation is a late medieval development in the iconography of the crucifixion, which is not about Christ at all, who appears to us in the image dead, having been removed from the cross, at a moment between his removal from the cross and his burial. In fact, this is an image which is not about Christ himself, but specifically about the women who attend him at the tomb and who prepare his body for burial. It is about sadness, about grief, the power of grief 
and the power of that expression of grief. The women in this image you can see are the ones whose faces are illuminated. Uh, the men appear in darkness and shadow or their faces are turned away from us. And only Mary, uh, the mother, and Mary Magdalene, uh, the follower of Christ, are revealed to us with the light striking their faces and their faces in expressive postures of grief and sadness turned down toward the body and up toward heaven on the right. Rubens painted the subject many times, and our picture is a particularly interesting and, and important example in the development of his treatment of the subject. We can see, for instance, similarities between his slightly earlier 1602 version of the Lamentation in which the figures of Mary, Mary Magdalene, and Mary Magdalene in our picture are so closely similar. Uh, we can compare also the figures in his Berlin Lamentation from 1610, and his 1612 picture in the Getty Museum. We can compare this Rubens picture in the Cumber Museum as well to Michelangelo's Rondonini Pietà, which Rubens saw when he was in Italy. The posture of the legs in particular recalls that of the famous unfinished Pietà that, that uh, Michelangelo died before he could complete one of his most famous works. Uh, we can also see that echo in Peter Paul Rubens' Descent from the Cross, in which the posture of the Rondonini Pietà occurs again here in the legs of Christ being lowered from the cross. But this is, again, not a subject that's really about Christ. It's about our response to his death. It's about us. It's about grief. And the women in this picture who cry and who express their grief, who wail to heaven, who hold their arms out and beseech God, they are for us triggers and mirrors of our own possibilities of grief and expression, which we know it is essential to be able to express pain. It is essential to be able to acknowledge hurt. Uh, and uh, in the lamentation, women are the, um, the opportunity for us figuratively to envision that expression. In the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, the suffering, the sorrow of the Virgin in particular was a common subject, which was visualized in many cases by the image of a sword piercing her heart, grief as something physical. The seven sorrows of the Virgin are visualized sometimes by seven swords piercing the breast of the Virgin. But that feeling of expression, that power of grief it is itself something that's very important, not just to express, it's powerful because it changes us and it changes the world around us. Grief is a powerful thing. Uh, in the Middle Ages, in fact, they thought of grief and compassion, uh, compassion, which literally means suffering with someone, feeling their pain. And as we feel Mary's pain when we look at these images, they thought of grief and compassion as weapons, as weapons that could slay indifference, as weapons that could overcome resistance to change by galvanizing people's hearts, by moving them in the directions that grief must move us to respond to tragedy. And that takes us then, I think, to a final theme here in uh, Nina's collection, which I, I really find fascinating. This, uh, this picture, which we'll talk about now, is uh, one of the last ones that she acquired, and a really fascinating picture to end on. Uh, drink deep or taste not the Pierian, Pierian spring. A little learning is a dangerous thing. That was the motto inside the uh, library entrance in my undergraduate college. And I, I've always wanted to use that in a lecture at some point. So I, uh, I took that here as my, my uh, intro to this little segment of our talk. The Pierian spring was a spring on the famous Mount Helicon in Greece, which was the home of the muses. The muses on, uh, on Mount Helicon uh, were um, uh, uh, associated, of course, with all of the great human works. The nine muses were the uh, patron deities of all of the human skills and arts of, of eloquence and poetry and writing and music and dance and art. All of the things that Nina was interested in uh, and that we also in turn are interested in as patrons of the museum, but also as citizens of the world, because what is the world without art of some kind, without the skill of expression and creation and without beauty? 
The muses live on Mount Helicon, where the famous Pierian spring and another spring, the Hippocrene, uh, blossom forth out of the ground. These founts, these springs, are sources of inspiration. And those who drink from them, who drink deep of learning or drink deep of art and poetry, are moved and empowered to do great things in the world. And the last subject uh, uh, that we'll talk about today is this subject itself. It is the subject of muses and inspiration and of art and of skill. It's the story of Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, Athena in the Greek pantheon, Minerva in the Latin. Minerva visiting the muses on Mount Parnassus, which is the, one of the last paintings made by the great French master Claude Lorraine. Uh, it's an interesting subject, first of all, because it involves all women. Uh, the muses are, live on uh, Mount uh, uh, Helicon uh, underneath the temple of Apollo. Apollo, of course, is a male god and the brother of, of Athena, of Minerva. And in a lot of pictures, we find Apollo at the center of this tribe of beautiful muses. Here is Apollo with his lyre. And uh, here in Raphael's picture, we find Apollo again at the center of the image, surrounded by uh, beautiful muses. Here, Apollo is kind of throwing a party. We often find him in this guise with uh, um, the beautiful young muses and a lot of bearded old men, <laughs> poets and philosophers and such. Uh, a, a very uh, sort of chauvinist kind of version uh, of the, uh, the muses subject. Uh, as we find here also Nicolas Poussin in Apollo and the muses. But Claude Lorraine gives us a different version. This is the matriarchal version. There is no Apollo. In fact, there isn't a single man in the image. This is all women. And uh, Minerva herself, the goddess uh, of wisdom, comes to visit the muses. She wants to see the spring. She shows up and she says, uh, uh, muses, will you show me to these famous springs of knowledge and inspiration? There's a drawing of our uh, picture, which is in the British Museum. I'd love to see them side by side someday, it'd be nice. Uh, but our, uh, our drawing and our picture of the muses depict the moment where Athena or Minerva arrives at Mount Helicon and she's greeted by two of the muses. She's greeted by Urania, the muse of, uh, of astronomy, a kind of philosophical muse, and by Melpomene, uh, who is the muse of tragedy. And it's very specific why she's greeted by these two. Uh, uh, Urania is a cosmic figure. She's a kind of universal figure uh, who encompasses in some ways all of the others. And likewise, the, uh, the figure of Melpomene is a, uh, a figure who is um, uh, a, um, uh, a figure of tragedy. And she directs us to uh, the moral lessons of tragedy. Tragedies are things, as we say, we should learn from. And that's certainly the function of a figure like Melpomene, who when she greets us, she directs us to learn from our mistakes. And that really is the function of history, isn't it? What do we say? Those who don't know the past are doomed to repeat it. These two muses meet Minerva and introduce her to a third, who we see here seated with a book on her lap. This is Calliope. Calliope, the muse of epic poetry. That is the muse who, whose, whose work is to record the great deeds worth remembering. The great deeds of people who do things, people of achievement, who accomplish something, who leave something to the world that should be remembered not only for its own sake, but because the people who did these things are examples for us uh, that we can aspire to live up to in our own lives, in our own histories. The story of Minerva and the Muses is told perhaps less commonly than the story of Apollo and the Muses, uh, but it is a story which was in, in its own way far more meaningful. When Minerva comes and she greets the Muses, they tell her these, uh, uh, these uh, stories about the spring and about the past. And uh, they tell her in particular a story about the Pierides, uh, who are sisters who challenged the muses themselves. Nine sisters who thought they could sing better than the muses and they challenged the muses foolishly to uh, a competition. They lost and for their, for their lack of humility and for their ignorance, they were transformed into magpies and we see them flying off over here on the right-hand side. In our picture, 
uh, and this is the moment just before Minerva is told this story about the magpies. The magpies will offer us an example of, of tragedy, uh, of hubris, of, of, of people who did something out of ignorance and uh, uh, without, without the kind of humility and without the kind of good intention that should guide our actions. We did something simply out of pride. And I think there is a moral lesson there that was extremely important in the Renaissance when this was painted. Uh, that is that people of great ambition who strive to do great things should do them for the right reasons, not simply in order to increase their own, their own sense of self, not simply out of a sense of grandiosity, but because of the sincere desire to do good things. Uh, Minerva is the goddess of doing good things, the goddess of wisdom, the goddess of great achievement. Uh, in this image of her visiting the muses on Mount Helicon, we see the image down below here at the bottom, just above a, a text that reminds us that whatever flowers on earth, these are Pallas Athena's arts. And by me, Athena, did the skill and the spirit of genius come to be. And no wonder, she says, since I spring from the brain, the very best part of Jove himself, no wonder am I the most cherished child of God, wisdom. Wisdom, which was thought in the Renaissance of, uh, as a, a good in itself and as the antithesis of ignorance, which uh, a kind of willful ignorance, which is a perversity, which, uh, which in the Renaissance was considered to be almost evil. Uh, if we have a moral lesson to take from this picture and from Nina Kummer's collection, I think it's just that, that she wanted for us to cherish good things for the right reasons and to remember good things and the examples they set for us for the future. Her museum is such a good thing. The collection that she assembled is such a good thing. And there are many more morals to be drawn from it. I'm very pleased to have shared some of the allegories and stories behind these pictures today and the ways in which they might relate to Nina's personality. I'd be delighted at this point to take your questions. Uh, the um, chat function in Zoom is a good place for you to drop any questions that you might have, questions or comments. And I'd be very pleased to, uh, to respond to any questions that you, uh, that you have and would like to, uh, to share today. In your Zoom bar, you can find uh, at the top or the bottom uh, the uh, chat icon. If you click that, it will bring up a window in which you can type your questions and uh, share your thoughts or reflections. And uh, thank you uh, for, a, uh, um, for coming to our, our lecture today. I've just received a, a thank you in the chat and I want to, uh, uh, to acknowledge that. Are the lady in the, uh, in, in the portrait, are her eyes looking into different directions? Uh, well, that is a, an interesting question. Let's take a look here. Uh, so I, I would say a no, a yes and no. Uh, um, one of the issues that we have here with this picture is that it is a um, uh, it is a picture by a an artist who is um, perhaps not the the very best in the West, <laughs> uh, but it, he's not a master of perspective. And so there are some peculiarities of the figure which are simply artifacts of the style of the time. Uh, they don't reflect the fact that the woman herself was wall-eyed or had any uh, 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 biological problems with her eyes. Um, uh, they are meant, however, because she's turning her face away from us, they're meant to turn back toward us to engage the viewer. And that, I think that gives them a slightly awkward uh, focus. Uh, are there any other uh, questions? I want to thank you all for your positive comments in the in the chat and for your your responses. As I as I uh, conclude here, I want to thank one more time. I want to thank all of our.
uh, our participants. I want to thank the Kummer Beaches and uh, the Kummer Museum of Art and Dr. Jacobson for sponsoring our lecture series. Uh, I want to thank our, our wonderful director, uh, uh, Dr. Brownlee, and um, all of the, you who have participated in, in this talk and in any of those that we've held in the past. I look forward to the next uh, iteration of the Jacobson Lecture Series next year. Thank you all. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all again in the real world, I hope, <laughs> very, very soon. Uh, this Zoom thing is OK, but it's, uh, it's not like getting together in, in the museum. So I'll see you all down there uh, very soon, I hope. Take care, everyone. And have a wonderful evening and uh, go visit the museum. Bye bye, everyone.